You all know me, Jessica, from Nairobi, Kenya. I'm not going to introduce myself again, but I want to tell you the story about Ushaidi. Uh, and I want to come closer to you. OK, they're not allowing me to come closer to you. Well, but I love you all. So Ushaidi actually means, hmm, let's see. Let's do a test. What does Ushaidi mean from the hands that were arisen earlier on? Just shout out. What does it mean? Witness, perfect. Who is that? <laughs> OK. So this is why Ushaidi was born. In 2008, Kenya was undergoing a post-election violence. There were riots. The, the country was in siege. People were fighting each other. Uh, there was no, there was no information flow. The country actually came to a standstill. There's a problem right here. This session is about solutions, tools, and responsive engineering. What are the people on the ground going to do? What are the bloggers on the ground who are acting as information dissemination, disseminators going to do? What kind of tools were they going to come up with? What kind of responsive engineering were they going to come up with? The story of Ushaidi begins, ladies and gentlemen. This is, how it, this is how it began. So four people, Eric Hersman, Aria Kolo, Juliana Rotich, and David Kobia were behind this. So Ari Okolo actually came up with this idea. She was a blogger, an activist online, actually monitoring what was going on. And she was communicating with the bloggers in Kenya. And she said, hey, we're having this problem of information dissemination. Why don't we do this? Why don't you create a visual interface whereby people can submit their problems happening on the ground if there were riots via the mobile phone, via a, a web phone, and via SMS technology. We've just seen how people can find doctors from a, a short code number. Hmm, Eric Hersman picked this up, 2008, and it was like, let's do this. So they met with Juliana Rutic and David Kobia, who actually uh, is part of behind the technology, and they got together and started brainstorming, four of them. And that's, those are the co-founders of Ushaidi right there. What you see is actually the Ushaidi calendar. It's the timeline of what happened. So right there, post-election violence, between December 30th to 1st January, there was media blackout. People, we needed a solution. We needed tools. We needed responsive engineering. The idea of Ushaidi through the co-founders. Ushaidi discussed. Ushaidi prototyped. How did this happen? is that a call was sent out globally calling all volunteer developers, designers, we need your help, Kenya needs you. We need you to develop a core technology which is open source, which can help Kenya to reach out to the global world, to tell the world what's going on in terms of the situation in Kenya. Between January 3rd to the 9th, how many days, ladies and gentlemen? Six, Six days. Technology these days, takes a month, two months, three months, deployment, six months. This was emergency. Six days, Ushaidi Co. Ushaidi Co. was launched. And between that time span of January 9th to 26th, it was undergoing additional functionality, as you see, RSS feeds, SMS technology, short code partnership, the Ushaidi blog added, timeline, and between January 10th to January 12th, you could see what was happening right there. So this is what has happened during the period of the month of January. What you see right now is the first version of Ushaidi. This is a very rare image to get. This is how, this is the birth inception of an open source platform that would be revolutionary three years later. And this is the way it, you send information to Ushaidi Co. via the mobile phone, email, and web. And how does it work? How, how, how do you actually ensure this quality assurance happening? 
So during the verification process, there are actually like three, three tiers of quality checks going on. And an instance of Ushaidi was actually uh, deployed in Liberia by uh, Unocha, and it, uh, it underwent three tiers of quality assurance. So it's actually people on the ground that actually verify, and this happened in Kenya as well. So in a nutshell, today what Ushaidi is, it's an open source software for information collection, visualization, and interactive mapping. Why is this so important? Visuals, visuals are very important. As Eric said, Mapbox can be used to tell stories. You extract data. Data is all numerical, but when you put data in formats such as maps and make classes out of them, you can tell a story. You can tell the intensity that happened here, where resources need to be spread. So platform community and movement is extremely important. And it creates that level of transparency, and it allows individuals to share their story. Ushaidi has made this possible. What I'm going to show you right now are examples of Ushaidi being used globally. One, Ushaidi has been used in disaster response. March 2011, what happened in Japan? What happened in Japan, March 2011? Everyone knows this, come on. All right, so the Japanese took Ushaidi, took the core platform, and we, uh, we, the Ushaidi team didn't even know this. We actually knew a few hours before. They took the platform, translated the whole platform, and actually rolled it out. And you could see like there were 4,000 reports and about 140,000 plus views. You could actually tell which areas along Japan were actually under threat. So you can see the threat areas right there. This is all in Japanese, so yeah. So you could actually monitor the tsunami intensity in the different areas. And how, how, how this helps in, deci in decision making, solutions, responsive engineering, example of responsive engineering, taking the technology that already exists, and this is the beauty of open source, is that you can, don't reinvent the wheel, go and check out what there is already, deploy, quick, quick, that's what we need, we need quick response. Another example is Haiti. January 2010. Ladies, I'm test ladies and gentlemen, I need to test your knowledge as well. So what happened in Jan 2010? What happened? Haiti, what happened? Everyone knows this. Earthquake. All right. So Ushaidi was actually deployed there again. And, and, and this is the genesis of what, what's happening now. This is like where it all started coming together is that Ushaidi learned a lot from the Haiti deployment is because there were these features added, change this, change that. So community feedback was coming in into the open source, and this is a core for open source, right? You, it, you build based on community feedback. What do we need, what we don't need, and stuff like that. Uh, these are other examples of Ushaidi being used in election monitoring uh, in India, in Kenya during the referendum. It's also been used in citizen journalism. Uh, Harris map and the oil spill crisis. So you can see the diversity of a platform like that being used in different areas. It was even used during the Egyptian revolution as well. And this is the example I gave uh, of it being used by uh, Unocha. And this, this deployment actually had three tiers of uh, quality assurance. If you want to know how the workflow works, come and see me later, I'll show it to you. So, all these examples I've been, giving, I've been giving you, what does it mean? It's, it's about changing the way information flows in the world. To different people, it's three tiers of quality assurance. Some, to some people, it's one tier. But it's us as people who build this technology for solutions and we use engineering. So it's up to us how we adapt this technology for, for a particular, for a particular problem or solution, right? Anyway, so what did we learn over the last three years is that the Ushaidi core technology was, was not easy for non-technical people to deploy. So what the Ushaidi team went out and did after Haiti uh, is that we actually launched 
a cloud instance of Gushaidi called CrowdMap. And CrowdMap, if you go to uh, crowdmap.com, any person here in this room actually roll out an instance of Gushaidi and tell your story. Brilliant, right? And it's for free. And we did it before you guys. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. Just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking. This is just a joke. Humor. <laughs> anyway, uh, a bit of the growth about Ushaidi. Uh, sorry about that. That is just a bit of humor to break the intenseness in the room. But over the last two years is that uh, Ushaidi has grown. We've seen over 20,000 plus deployments. We have reached 128 countries and counting. And we've learned key lessons. Key lessons are, as I did mention, is that it's easy to deploy a platform. It's easy to tell a story. It's, technology is there. But you need to understand why are we deploying this tool? For what, what, what kind of use is it for? So we need to understand the technical people and the non-technical people. And Ushaidi has actually understood that we have Ushaidi Co. That's easy for the technical people to deploy in case they're in a certain emergency situation and the non-tech people where crowd, crowd map exists. Uh, volunteers, extremely important. The, these are the people behind the verification system, behind Ushaidi. We need translators. You saw the, the example of Japan. We need developers, the core developers from the Ushaidi team, but also volunteer developers around the world. We need mappers because this is visuals. We need to know how, how do you want this? Do you want mapping tiles, do you want Bing Maps, do you want Google uh, Maps, and we need testers. And this is, you are the testers, community are here are the testers. In actual situation, you are the testers. So yeah, we can do it. Um, so I have an idea, and feel free to push back, but um, we, we, we very typically talk about problems and solutions, uh, needs and assets. Um, it's, it's somewhat transactional. Um, one group has this area of expertise, uh, maybe healthies. Another group has this area of expertise, maybe techies. And you know, they get together, and this it's a beautiful union. And, and we all should be doing that all the time. That's, that's what we should be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, that's how we actually you know, change systems, change people do di things differently, and different outcomes are achieved. But I want to propose something, um, that we try something a little bit different. And, this is going to sound strange, but sort of like falling in love, and I don't really know what that means or is, but sort of like falling in love, I, I, have to, I feel like great collaboration can feel like that at times. And much like love might be sort of deep meeting deep, I, I want to tap into the uh, sort of well of optimism that I can feel in the room and that I can feel on stage. And I, I think that, that maybe something might be more compounding and exponential about two people's deep, deep-seated optimism meeting each other. Um, and so that's a question I'm going to ask lots of you when I meet you later. But I want to start with our panelists. You know, what is it uh, about this moment? About uh, maybe it's a technical thing, but but really, uh, what what is what is fueling your current optimism? Uh, and can you put it into words for us? And maybe we'll start with Eric and circle back, because I'll I'll try to answer as well. Right. Um, I mean, what I'm most excited about is, is it's a total changing paradigm of where data comes from. It used to be bought by very rich companies. Um, what I'm really excited about is where, where data comes from. It used to be bought by really rich companies. Uh, now it's, I, I really see OpenStreetMap, which is not a new idea. It's an uh, idea from 2004, about to hit a tipping point, where you have over these half million users that are going to give such good data around where they live that there's nothing that that could ever, that that could ever uh, buy. So I think that's what's going to be most exciting uh, moving forward, like, in, like incredibly optimistic uh, about that. So. <coughs> huh. Well, I have to say it's the growing engagement, just the growing participation and collaboration. When we first started traveling to work in countries, we saw computers sitting dead in closets, many of them where there had been efforts of technology to come out and try and fail. And in fact, when we first started talking about trying to do technology in these countries, we said it's not even worth it, there's no infrastructure, there's no capacity, nothing can happen. 
Well, it turned out we must have been near a switch point ourselves because it was working. And other people we started talking to, it was working for them. And it was starting to work. And then we had a good couple of years there where, yes, technology was being adopted, it was being absorbed, and people were responding well to it, and it kept working. And then we started to hit another switch point where it was beyond that. People started asking. I remember when we heard for the first time that a pilot had been conducted that we didn't even know about beforehand. Somebody had taken the software, rolled it out, conducted a pilot in the district of Ghana, and was going to be, I'm going to say it's his name, Dr. Coyote Odusodi of the West Africa Health Organization, went into Ghana, worked with the Ministry of Health, rolled out a pilot, and boom, presented it to other countries in the region, again, independent of us, and said, hey, look at this thing and how valuable it is for us. Before we knew it, the other countries were grabbing the software. I mentioned Togo earlier. Got it themselves, translated it into French, rolled it out, got the things going. We're saying, whoa, wow. All of a sudden, we're responsive. We're no longer out saying, hey, here's a solution. Here, take it, go away. All of a sudden, we're like, OK, how do we meet the needs? How do we help make this work? And that is the most exciting thing I've ever seen, is to watch it starting to roll and to build up steam. It's starting to happen, and it's happening across the board. We're seeing ownership. We're seeing engagement, we're seeing involvement, we're seeing opportunity. It's fantastic. Thank you. I think um, the optimism I have is that the health worker will receive more attention than they have received before. Because now we'll have clear employment history, the problems easily identified from the records that we have and easily shared, and therefore the solutions will be easier to develop. And I also see a situation where we shall be more efficient, applying the limited resources to more well-defined problems based on evidence, as, as we have ever done before. And um, I see greater advocacy for the health workforce using data, telling people, clear, people who take decisions clearly what the issues are with clear evidence and therefore guiding the way governments allocate resources, governing the way donors allocate resources for the health workforce. And this should see us improving the health workforce and in turn improving the quality of care and in turn improving health outcomes and well-being of the people. That's my optimism. Hmm. I'm actually pondering, but I, I think what I'm uh, optimistic about and what the Ushaidi uh, community is actually optimistic about is this cross-cutting technology and where each of us here is that the technology actually um, it, it kind of brings us together like for Eric's platform is that um, from a researcher perspective is that we're able to take data and make uh, meaningful information out of it visuals uh, which actually uh, mean a lot to people at higher level deci decision makers it makes it easier for them to make decisions and and as uh, um, Vincent said that um, it's important there's, avid uh, uh, there's evidence right there for you to actually say hey this, it's, it's here, look at it, and this is what we need to do. So uh, coming back to the Ushaidi platform is that it, it's all about community uh, telling stories, but there's more to, to community telling stories is that we're able to increase the transparency and the governance uh, gap between uh, community, people at grassroots levels, and people hi higher up in uh, the hierarchy. So uh, apart from telling stories from these different platforms is that there's some level of accountability which is extremely important, is that you'll be able to hold your, your government accountable. Hey, you didn't, there was this uh, X amount of funds uh, donated to this particular state, why isn't my road fixed? And, and, and this is possible in all the different uh, communities uh, here. So I think it, it, for me, the optimism is that it, it is given, given citizens, especially the youth, uh, a voice, an online voice. Technology, this kind of technology is giving the young citizens uh, an online voice to actually voice out. And uh, what's happening right now is that with all the revolutions that have been happening in Africa, from Egypt to Tunisia and all, the youth are not going to be quiet they're going to cause a revolution. And in Kenya, it's, it's, it's what, what we are discussing right now is what we call the African Revolution. And, and tools such as this are actually going to actually uh, stir up that, that
that revolution. So early on in, in the earlier session, you actually saying uh, protest in, in Arabic. Am I not right? Yeah, so it's, it's kind of going, going to create not the negative protest, but a good protest. We need to hold our leaders account, accountable and we need a better world. So platforms like this, if it makes it possible, so be it. So I feel like I should also answer my own question. Those are that's fantastic. Thanks for, thanks for responding. For me, uh, it feels like time has been sort of backwards in, in terms of uh, in terms of health systems. And I'll explain by saying that we've been pushing to decentralize healthcare because of resource constraints for decades, you know, since 1970. We've now trained 10 million community health volunteers all over the world. You heard about 850,000 ASHAs in India. Um, there are another 1.8 more, less, 1.8 million less formal community-based healthcare workers. We've been pushing to decentralize for 40 years. And all of a sudden, we now have an infrastructure upon which to coordinate um, and, and, and it's, it's it, you know, if there is some sort of master plan, that was a weird one. Because, you know, we're now, like, we now finally have uh, this infrastructure that we can use. Um, and and the, the neat thing, what's part of partially fueling my optimism is that it's moving way faster than anyone ever predicted. And, and still, we're really bad at predicting. So fully 50% of people in sub-Saharan Africa own a personal mobile phone today. Experts say that will be 100% in two years. So I just start saying it's going to be a year and a half. Mm -hmm. So that will be 100% in a year and a half. So quote me on that. And you know, it's probably even a shorter time span than that. So you know, we, we, we see that. And then we say, given that the next billion mobile devices, the next billion new mobile connections, will be exactly where global health experts care about the most, exactly they're headed straight to the rural developing world and straight to people earning less than a dollar a day. Um, and they're $7 phones, they're GSM-only phones. They're going out, they're shipping tomorrow by the hundreds of thousands. I mean, they're, they're going as you know, faster than anything has ever shipped and moved in human history. So given that, how can we wrangle that infrastructure to improve essential services, save lives, and make our world better? And you know, for us, that meant we go online, we see that you can run SIM applications, we find some hackers in Prague who make a little computer that can slide in next to an existing SIM card. That platform runs our applications. The existing SIM card ties into the mobile network. And we can run treatment protocols on $7 phones. So that was, I mean, that's our narrative of trying to wrangle this massive infrastructure. And that's the type of thing that we're doing. And, and I think we just need a lot more of it. Um, and I'll let you guys take that to lunch. Um, <laughs> and thanks for, thanks for joining us. Uh,